Welcome to a new video for physical science. In this video we're discussing magnets and magnetic fields. So magnetic forces. A force a magnet exerts on another magnet on iron or a similar metal or on moving charges. So magnetic fields have the greatest influence on material that are good conductors that have metal properties. Okay? Something to keep in mind. So an insulator would not be a um, would not be something that a magnetic field would have much influence on. So um, we all know how when we have magnets, um, you have a south and a south end on a magnet. When you try to put them together, they repel each other, and a north and a north. So like magnetic fields will repel each other, just like in chemistry, uh, a like charge will repel each other, or different charges, opposite charges will attract. Just think back to the electrons and the protons and uh, the relationship between those uh, different charges. Likewise, the magnetic poles, you have a north pole and a south pole, or a north, north domain and a south domain. When you, uh, when you put opposite domains together, okay, they attract, and like ones will repel. Okay, so here you see a horseshoe magnet and the effects that it has. If you pay close attention to the iron fillings, Okay, those are that iron dust that you see, the metallic dust. You can kind of get a sense as to where those magnetic fields lie. So a magnetic field is kind of like an invisible, um, an invisible wave or an invisible arm, if you will, that's coming out of the magnetic poles that has effect, that has an influence on material that is surrounding it. In this case, you see the magnetic fields having an influence on on a, on dust that's metallic and you can see that that magnetic field the intensity of those magnetic fields are greater near the poles and they lessen as you go further away from the poles this particular principle was um, was established by English physician William Gilbert he uh, published this in the magnet he explained how forces are strongest at the poles and all magnets big and small have two magnetic poles and those we call the north and the south poles Okay, so again, these are the some of the words I highlighted, just so you can uh, know the terms that he's uh, he's uh, discussing in his paper. So we're talking about the forces and how they're strong at the poles, and we have two two poles. So this is most evident when you try to collect like connect like poles. So in class, if you recall, when you were holding the magnets and you tried to put the two like poles together, there was a repelling. They couldn't you could not put them together without applying a lot of force. And then likewise, when you were attacking, attract, uh, attaching opposite poles, they would immediately clamp up and uh, attach to each other. So like magnetic poles repel each other, and the opposites will attract. So this leads us again back to our magnetic fields, and this is kind of an image of what those magnetic fields look like. And as you can see, they're coming out of the north. Okay, Field lines begin near the magnets north, and they extend towards the south. Arrows in the fields indicate what direction the compass need, uh, needle would point. So where field lines are close together, the field is strongest. So again, notice those magnetic field lines, which I'm symbolizing by those white lines. Notice that they are closer together near the poles. So that means their intensity is greater at that point, and they're further away from each other as you go away from the pole, so it's not as intense. And again, here's another magnet with the uh, magnetic dust that I was speaking of earlier. And you can see, you can kind of get a visual of those mag uh, magnetic lines. So these field lines explain a commonly seen effect in magnets. So for example, that, that effect that I'm talking about is when you have like poles, a south and a south coming together, notice what happens to those magnetic field lines. Okay, field lines interfere with each other and they repel. They push each other away. Now, and you can see here with the north-north, uh, you can tell that those magnetic field lines are just pushing each other away. And the weakest point of this connection is, or lack of connection, is in the middle where you don't see any of the dust, metallic dust forming. Now notice what happens when I do a north and south. Those magnetic field lines do interact with each other. They do kind of envelop each other, kind of like a hug, if you will, and they bring each other closer. And the most intense uh, field uh, effect is felt in the middle. And that's you can see the, the large crowding of magnetic dust, uh, magnetic iron fillings in that area. So uh, the planet, planet Earth is uh, an example of a massive magnet. 
you have a north end and a south end. The magnetic south is our geographic north, and the magnetic north is our geographic south, our south pole. So this is a large-scale example of an organic material being magnetized. Now take notice also how the magnetic field lines go out of Earth as well. These magnetic field lines, which are massive, and they extend for uh, th hundreds of thousands of miles outside of space, these magnetic field lines actually create a force field, if you will, around Earth, a protective field that blocks a lot of dangerous radio, uh, radioactive material from the sun and space. So it acts as a nice little shield or umbrella that protects us from harmful rays in space. Remember that all material is made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And this kind of goes back to the planet Earth. Planet Earth, for the most part, is an organic material made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which is what most insulators are made out of. And as I mentioned before, insulators make poor, um, poor magnets. Okay, They don't work well with magnets. They don't really attract with magnets. But... The fact that they're made out of electrons, something interesting can be done here. So think of an electron. They have, uh, they have a positive and a negative spin. So you'll have one electron that's spinning positive direction, and if there's another electron near it, it's going to have a negative. Okay, so I want to take a quick pause on the video to show you the website where I'm getting the research uh, of what I'm talking about here. You can go to Radboud University. This is the research website where they're doing the diamagnetic levitation. You can go through the website and you can see how they're causing these, these uh, organic material to become magnetic and to levitate. So they're doing it with frogs, crickets, strawberries. So you can go to their website. Uh, this is a university in um, the Netherlands. And they do an explanation here um, of the electron spin that, I was, that I'm explaining in the video, where they can cause the spins of electrons to go in one direction, thus causing them uh, to have magnetic properties and then giving them the ability to uh, to levitate. So go ahead and search this website, uh, have some fun, and uh, we'll go back to our video now. Negative spin. They offset each other, they balance each other out. Just like a uh, proton and an electron, a positive charge and negative charge, if they're together, they cancel each other out to have a neutral charge. Likewise, electrons, when they spin, we have a positive spin and a negative spin, and they cancel each other out. Okay, so they can be compared to the opposite field lines, opposite field domains. So a magnet, a magnet has a north and a south, so an electron has a positive and negative, and they cancel each other out, giving a neutral magnetic effect. These materials have weak magnetic fields, these organic materials. These electrons and their spins create magnetic field domains. Okay, so the electrons that we are all made out of, they have specific spins, which gives us a sort of a magnetic field. Okay, actually, let me go back here real quick. Speaking on the electrons, uh, let me just finish up this point. Now, so what I was mentioning before is that um, something interesting can happen with organic material, material that's not metallic. Okay, so we uh, we are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and other elements, and a nail is made out of iron for the most part, right? So that's clearly a magnetic material, whereas we are not. So theoretically. Because of our electrons having spins and having a sort of a magnetic domain, you could theoretically create, uh, cause the electrons in a human being or in an organic material to have the same spin. And if you cause all the electrons to have a same spin, then you create a dipole environment where you have one end being positive and then one end being negative. And like a magnet, uh, a magnet is made out of millions or... Uh, a magnet or magnetic material is made out of millions and millions of little domains, magnetic domains. And when you have a nail, nails naturally do not attach to each other because of these magnetic domains are randomly situated. They're orientated in random positions, which ends up canceling out their magnetism and gives them no magnetic properties at all. Likewise with electrons. Electrons have a positive and negative spin that they end up just canceling each other out. So what can happen, or what does happen with a magnetic material, these magnetic domains, so if this is the magnetic, if this is what the magnetic domains look like for a non-magnetic uh, material, these are what the domains look like in a magnet. They are all specifically orientated in a north-south position, and that's what gives a magnet its magnetic uh, properties. In a human, theoretically, or in a cricket, or in a grasshopper, 
if you were able to align the electrons, cause them to spin in the, in the same direction like you would in a material, causing the domains to um, align in a certain direction, you can actually create uh, a very strong magnetic field in, let's say, a cricket or a human, and you can make them levitate. And there is some research uh, that I've seen in Europe, I'll have to put the link up, where um, scientists now can make frogs levitate, grasshoppers levitate, uh, based off of this principle. So a magnet will have magnetic domains that look like this. Now, in class, I showed you guys a uh, magnet, and I attached a clip, um, a paper clip, a metal clip, uh, paper clip. Actually, let me back up here. A metal paper clip initially has domains that are online like this. It's not, it doesn't have any initial magnetic properties. But when I attached the paper clip to a magnet, the domains shifted and turned to this. Okay, they were orientated differently. And then I created, I was able to attach other paper clips to that other paper clip, or to that first paper clip, and uh, that paper clip basically became a magnet. It became a temporary magnet. So it went from having domains that look like this to having domains look like that. But then when I detached the paper clip, the, the initial one, when I detached the paper clip from the magnet, the domains went back to that. It lost its magnetic uh, properties. Okay, and that's what we call a temporary magnet. So other ways to lose magnetic alignment is to drop magnets, which will realign the domains. This is why I tell you to be careful when the magnet, uh, with the magnets that I give you. Try not to drop them because when you drop them, that will realign those magnetic domains and a magnet will slowly lose its magnetic fields uh, based off of that. So here's an image of the um, temporary magnets. As I mentioned, you can attach one paper clip to the magnet, which will then create, which will then cause that paper clip to be uh, turned into a magnet. It will align its uh, domains all in one direction. Well, that does it for this discussion. I hope this helped and good luck in your studying.